Okay, thank you everyone for joining us for the webinar, Creative Trails Programming Through private, uh, Public-Private Partnerships. My name is Candace Gallagher and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 207th webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. This webinar is being recorded. It includes real-time closed captioning in English and also offers free learning credits. And in the chat box, you will see links for the closed captioning, learning credit quiz, and the survey there. Um, and attendees will receive a follow-up email from me uh, within two days following the webinar that will include a link to the recording, the transcript, um, and the resources slide with the presenter emails um, so you can contact them with any questions following the webinar. And this webinar is free to the public thanks to our webinar partners that include the Bureau of Land Management, the Federal Highway Administration, the National Park Service, as well as the USDA Forest Service. And I would like to introduce our presenters for today. We have Beth Smith, who is an urban planner and designer with Beale Energy Engineering. Uh, we also have Jody Bumstein, with, uh, who is the Child Advocacy Program Specialist um, in Beha Behavioral and Mental Health with the Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And lastly, we have Lindsay Jorstad, who is the Deputy Department Director with Gwinnett County uh, Department of Community Services. So I will pass the controls over to Beth today uh, and get started with today's webinar. Awesome, thank you so much, Candace. And we will give just a second for Ms. Elena to get our deck up, perfect. All right, so hi, I'm Beth Smith. I'm an urban planner and designer uh, in Metro Atlanta. I've been a consultant for my entire career working both in the land use and transportation planning sectors. I currently serve as the program manager for Gwinnett Trails, which is the countywide trails program uh, for a suburban county in one of the largest counties in Georgia. I've been the Gwinnett Trails program manager since 2019 when the program began. And then um, that was actually after we developed the countywide trails plan, which I was the deputy project manager for as well. And I'm also a Gwinnett resident, so I'm really excited to present a little bit about this program that I am so personally invested and professionally invested in. Um, so today, uh, next, Elena you'll be hearing about one of our creative programming partnerships that we've recently launched on some Gwinnett Trails in our county's parks. We'll start with an intro uh, to our Gwinnett Trail system where I'll share some high level details about our program. Then Jody will dive into the Strong for Life Raising Resilience campaign that we worked on and share her perspective as a mental health expert who developed the content for our project. And then Lindsay will cover details of the Live Healthy Gwinnett program, which is partnered with Children's Healthcare on other programs in the county's park system, as well as developed a really robust network of partners and a catalog of programs uh, for recreation in our community. Uh, before we dive into our presentation, I do want to share a brief, it's about a two minute video from one of our local news stations about our project, and that will really help set the stage for our presentation segments. So I think, um, Jody, if you want to share that video for us real quick. And Jody, you'll just need to unmute yourself. All right, let's try that again. Don't forget to stop to Perfect. take in sights or smell the fresh air the next time you visit a Gwinnett County Park. And that's all thanks to a collaboration between Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, Live Healthy Gwinnett, and Gwinnett County Parks and Recreation. 11 Alive's Brittany Kleinpeter has the story. The next time you visit a Gwinnett County Park to unplug and unwind, don't leave your phone behind. So yes, we're using our phones, but the idea is really then to be in the moment. While a marriage between nature and technology may seem peculiar, therapists at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta say it's all to help you slow down. So the idea behind this is to give people permission to stop and think about how they actually feel. They're gonna use the QR code to guide you to something that we hope is really relaxing. Now, these new standable signs were recently placed along walking trails to virtually introduce children and families to the ideas of coping with mental health, as well as just being mindful. This one says, calm your mind. When you scan it, it pulls up in this video talking about ways to ground yourself. Grounding is something we can do anytime to slow down, relax, and calm our bodies and minds. 
The idea behind the Raising Resilience campaign is to spark the interest in mental health coping skills through everyday activities, and park goers say it's working. The more times I walked by and, and saw the sign, like, let me, let me check this out and scan it real quick. So, no, I, I love the idea that they actually done that. While the signage campaign just launched, organizers say they hope they can reach out to families that they wouldn't normally have access to. We all have emotions, we all have stress, so therefore we need to do things to take care of it. And part of doing this collaboration in the parks is really about helping people see that it can be done in everyday moments. In Gwinnett County, Brittany Kleinpeter. Alive and Alive News. Well, you can find the signage at Little Mulberry Park in Nepula, Lenore Park in Snellville. Looks like that cut off just a second. We'll uh, be sure to share out that video link. Um, but what that video did is gave a little bit of an overview of the Raising Resilience Initiative in Gwinnett County. And I wanna take a step back and really help provide some understanding of who Gwinnett County is and what our trail system is like. So Gwinnett County, Georgia is a suburban county. It was mostly rural in its land use patterns until development really boomed as a result of white flight out of Atlanta in the 70s and 80s. From the 80s through the early 2000s, Gwinnett was often cited as the fastest growing county in the US and this growth really changed the makeup of our county and drastically changed the rural agricultural focus of a bedroom community to one of a poster children for suburban sprawl. And one of the major draws to Gwinnett County has been our world-class park system and our top tier schools. Our park system success is partially attributed to a unique funding structure that was established in 1986 when leaders in the community uh, sought to conserve natural resources and green space in the county by establishing a one cent uh, property sales tax set aside for recreation uses. This tax is in place in perpetuity and it's led to a park system that is CAPRA accredited and it has many, many national awards and recognitions for its excellence. And when it still tops its fastest growing uh, county list that we see and with that growth has come some new challenges and considerations that we're responding to. Our roadway systems often top the list of the most congested in the country, and they really are feeding places of employment, uh, employment throughout uh, Metro Atlanta and serving as major thoroughfares for all of Georgia. It's a key location for freight uh, and movement of goods, especially as we see uh, impacts from the deepening of the Port of Savannah. And then in 2010, uh, Gwinnett really experienced a paradigm shift in our demographic makeup. We became a minority majority county um, with currently more than 140 languages that are spoken. And this diversity really has uh, created a focus for increasing mode and modal options within our community. And Gwinnett is anticipated to uh, continue to experience really astronomical growth as that little figure down there uh, shows. We are projected to grow by another half a million people by 2050. And that would actually make us the most populous county in Georgia, which would have us outpacing uh, Fulton County where the city of Atlanta sits. So lots and lots of growth that we're responding to. Elena, if you'll take me to the next slide. Um, so in 2015, I was really supporting the county with its comprehensive transportation plan, and that was the first update to the county's uh, transportation system that really focused on recognizing communities changing demographics and what those needs really meant. And while that study did do some bicycle and pedestrian analysis as part of the planning effort, we really recognized that we needed a much deeper dive that uh, to really con you know, conduct an analysis on these modes adequately and establish a vision for our trail system. Um, next, Elena. So in 2017, we embarked on the county's countywide trails master plan, and that was really in response to our changing demographics and modal needs um, and the analysis that we saw from the comprehensive transportation plan. And it was also sort of a response to some presiding opinions that we were hearing in Metro Atlanta that Gwinnett doesn't do trails. And that wasn't the case then. I, it's one of my favorite stories to tell. We had 130 miles of trails in our county at the time, but 125 of those were exclusively within our park system. So the Countywide Trails Master Plan followed a typical planning process, and that's shown in the diagram on the right. But what was really important to our process was the collaboration. Our plan uh, was developed in partnership with our Department of Transportation and Community Services, and that's where Parks and Recreation sits. And then in addition to those two departments collaborating and leading the charge, all county departments were stakeholders as well as regional leaders. Um, and then we also had all 16 of our cities and six of our community improvement districts at the table. And this collaboration is actually still important to this day in how we're implementing our program. It's still being implemented by both community services and transportation. And it also relies on the support of our departments of water resources, planning and development, communications, other departments, as well as cities, CIDs, and private partners. And then of course, our elected leaders who are sort of recognizing the importance of our program because we have so many partners at the table. Elena, next. 
So the map on the screen is what we're here to talk, is what, is what we're actually talking about when we refer to the County Wide Trails Master Plan. It's documented in this plan that I'm holding up. It's actually the, the center fold. Um, but if you want to see it on your screen, if you'll visit GwinnettTrails.com, you can see the whole plan as well as that center fold in a much uh, bigger space than we're able to do here in the presentation. Um, but it's really about making those connections that are identified on this map. Um, and again, if you'd like to spend some more time with our plan than we're able to do today and get more details than I'm able to share today, visit GwinnettTrails.com um, and you can view the plan in its entirety as well as some other details there. Elena, next slide. So our trails plan really helped to establish our trail topologies and these help you know, in shaping our system. One of the things as the Gwinnett Trails manager that I love to know is that our trails are our number one most loved and used amenity in our park system. And we know that because we pull our community frequently to understand what they love and what they want and need from our systems. So the trails plan really sought <clears throat> to take some of that magic of trails that the community loved within our parks and bring it to facilities that could serve both recreation functions as well as transportation needs. And that's what our topologies are based on. Um, our off-road trails, which are on the left, are most like what you see within our parks. They're focused on natural surroundings and settings and their amenities align with our park system. So they operate from dawn to dusk. And so you'll see the lack of lighting on those. Our side path, on the other hand, those trails are really parallel to our roadways and they feature lighting and other amenities that support 24 seven operations. They are also typically um, asphalt in their materiality. And that's because typically transportation is uh, implementing those trail segments. And they're also doing that as they're doing other projects adjacent on the roadway. So they already have the asphalt out in the space. And so that's the material of their choosing. Um, Off-road trails are typically concrete in materiality because that's what community services prefers. Um, so really documenting these two differences in trails types was important for our sort of definition of our Gwinnett Trails program because it helped the community to understand what a trail is in Gwinnett County. Before our plan, many people thought that the concrete trails that they were seeing were just extra wide sidewalks. And for the trails that run parallel to roadways that are made of asphalt, they didn't realize what they were, that they were walking trails and not, not roadway paths. So really defining those two types is helping our community understand what trails are. Um, next, Elena. So in addition to defining the types of trails, our trails plan identified the need to really create an identity and awareness of our system. And as I mentioned, people didn't realize we had a trail system despite having you know, triple digit mileage at the time. So one aspect of you know, establishing that identity was uh, creating a unified, really cohesive and recognizable brand for our trail system. You've seen the logo throughout this presentation so far, and we use that logo to inspire and craft a really robust suite of signage for our Gwinnett Trail system. And that full suite is along the bottom of the screen. Um, those pictures are actually from the first installation of this branded signage on one of our trails that uh, took place earlier this year. And we currently have an RFP that's out to get a fabricator to provide signage throughout our system. Um, one thing that I do want to call attention to is how we address the diversity of our community in our signage. You'll notice our signs are really text light and pictogram heavy. And that's because although I like to think of myself as a really good signage designer, I could never craft a sign that could coherently feature 140 languages at once and still be legible. So instead, we leverage the National Park Service's pictogram library, and we've added some additions that you know, or, you know, speak more to some of our needs or some of the things that we need to communicate in our community, and really are able to universally communicate with all users of our system. So you can see that on the, uh, the signage topology right there on the, the right hand, that posting. Um, so simultaneously to this implementation of our wayfinding system, Gwinnett Parks was also undergoing an effort to really reduce signage pollution within our parks. And part of that was focused on sort of reducing the physical number of signs in the place. Um, but also another aspect was on fewer words and less instructions. And doing this, this sort of initiative to reduce signage pollution helps to make our trail signage really pop, but it also helps to enable users to better connect with nature. Um, and it, it also allows us a space that we're able to do some of these programming campaigns like the Raising Resilience, not just one more sign blaring at you. Um, and so that we'll talk about today. I do want to point out that except for a couple of aluminum T frames that we had to add in in a few strategic places, all the placards that we'll talk about and show today um, were installed on existing signage infrastructure. And so that helped reduce the cost of our program to just needing to purchase a uh, signage placard specific to this initiative. Um, Elena, next slide. So another really important element of building awareness for Gwinnett Trails is communicating a system exists and helping to communicate uh, the community. 
recognize that it's an asset. So the Gwinnett Trails team can be found most weekends out at community events, such as you're seeing on the screen now, um, throughout the county. And we can, we really help to promote the system and provide education on the plan at these, uh, at these events. Elena, next slide. So in addition to that physical presence, we're also building awareness of our system digitally through our hashtag, Gwinnett, uh, or hashtag Trails Tuesday campaigns on the Gwinnett uh, Park and Recreation Facebook and Instagram account. Each Tuesday, those accounts share out posts that educate the community on our system and plan. They help drum up interest in our system. Um, sometimes we'll do some engaging campaigns or challenges, like show a photo of your favorite trail. Um, or will help promote things that the program's doing. So for instance, this Raising Resilience campaign that we'll talk about in just a minute has been featured many times on our social accounts. And that helps to really reach people who may not even be aware that this programming exists or in what parks it exists. So they can go and uh, visit one of the featured parks and interact with this campaign. Um, Elena, next. And so we're really doing all of this work to advance our trails program. One thing that I haven't mentioned is that our aspirations are to grow that 130 miles that we started our trails planning effort with to more than 410 miles. And we don't currently have a horizon year. That's the one question that we always get um, in mind. And that's really because our success is tied to funding. And with more funds, we could do it faster. Couldn't we all? But uh, so we're trying to keep our, our program really flexible. Um, part of that is you know where where and how quickly we're able to do our system. But the other is making sure that our trails serve the needs of our community. And one thing that we're hearing in our community, and I'm sure that we're all as trail professionals or even enthusiasts, are seeing is really our desire for trails to be more than trails. And so we're incorporating some nodes along our trails that allow opportunities for people to stop and play to exercise, to learn and engage with nature or cultural and historic resources. Um, we're also developing trails that have edible landscape components like you're seeing here um, that really respond to food insecurity needs within our community, as well as to educate on the food system and you know, healthy foods and, and how you know, to grow gardens and vegetables and things like that. Elena, next slide. And so to do all of that, that's really comes with a cost. And so funding is the foundation of us being able to do all the things we want to do and to build a system that we want to and as quickly as we want to. So we have a couple of uh, current funding strategies. Our current major funding source for Gwinnett Trails is through SPLOST, which is Special Purpose Local Option Sales Tax. That is a one cent um, sales tax on nearly everything that's purchased within the county. And now all that funding that's you know accrued through that one cent sales tax doesn't go directly to trails. It's shared with education, police, libraries, um, but both community services and transportation, they put portions of their SPLOS funding to implement Gwinnett Trails. And then we've also pursued with success various state and federal funding and grant opportunities. And we'll continue to use those levers as we work to implement our system. Another element of our funding strategy has been through infrastructure overlap. And so I talked a little bit about DOT working on trails as they are doing roadway projects and sort of the economy of scales that we're able to get by you know, being out in the area, working on a bigger project, incorporating trails into roadway designs, all that helps us to really bring down the price of implementing a trail. And we also have a partnership with our Department of Water Resources, where we're now getting trail easements by right as they are acquiring their sewer easements. And that's really helping to lower the land acquisition costs of our projects into shortened timelines. Um, we're working with other utility providers, um, the electric companies to leverage their easements for our trails as well. But in addition to sort of that infrastructure, uh, state and federal funding and SPLOS sort of triad that we have, we do also partner with cities and CIDs to advance trails in their parts of the community. And sometimes that's through their share of SPLOS or other funding sources that they may have. Um, but the strategy that we're really here to talk about today is a public-private partnership that we recently undertook with Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, which is a local pediatric focused hospital system. Elena, next. Um, so we've had some success with NRPA's 10 minute walk campaign. Um, and you know, we were one of the first and still few counties in the country to sign on at the countywide level for that commitment to get our community within a 10 minute walk of a Parker Green space and trails count to, towards that initiative. Um, we've also had success with our local funding programs, but one of our most creative partnerships takes some inspiration from the Swamp Rabbit Trail in Greenville, South Carolina. And that is really partnering with uh, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta's Strong for Life program. Uh, to uh, do some programming, whereas you know, Swamp Labrador was really looking at capital investment, we've worked with our hospital system for programming specifically on our already built trails. And so for that part of the story, I'm gonna hand things over to Jody, who's gonna talk about the Raising Resilience campaign and how we launched it on Gwinnett Trails. So Jody. 
Thanks, Beth. So yes, I am with Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, and I am one of the therapists on the team who is really behind the content that we used as we partnered on this collaboration. Oh, sorry, next slide. I'm trying to adjust it myself. Thank you. Um, okay, so Strong for Life, just to give you an idea, it's out of Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, and originally it was designed to reduce the state of childhood obesity in the state of Georgia. So our original programming years ago was really focused on physical wellness, so nutrition and movement, but really over the last five plus years, it's expanded to be more about treating the whole child, and that includes emotional wellness, with a real recognition that emotional wellness, mental health is just as important as the physical, but all of our content has really expanded. So now it's everything from that nutrition, physical activity, to screen time, safe sleep, child protection, and of course, all of the mental health aspects. And the model for Strong for Life has always been the same in that our goal is really to reach kids wherever they are. So they're hearing consistent messaging, whether they're at school, after school camp, at the pediatrician's office, at an early care center, faith-based organization. We're working with all of these entities in our community to make sure that the adults who are working with kids are giving them the same concrete messages over and over and over. And that's really, how this came to be as we started with this raising resilience campaign which we'll talk about we started thinking about how do we work with other youth serving organizations how do we also work with people in the community like libraries and then that led us to this parks collaboration next slide please thank you so we're gonna we're gonna try to play another video see if this will work one second. Okay. So here in Georgia and across the nation, one of the core challenges that we're facing in the lives of our kids is supporting their behavioral and mental health. We've been noticing a phenomenon over the last probably five to seven years of young people more and more suffering from mental health issues to the point of crisis. How do we prevent ourselves from being at a place where kids are at a point of crisis? That's why this prevention work is so important. So we built a program that is really based on how do you foster resilience in kids? And you do that through two core things. One is normalizing conversations around feelings and emotions. And then second, really building proactively coping skills in kids. It's really helpful to be proactive and getting families to think ahead about addressing stress in kids' lives and building some skills in advance so that they can tackle these challenges and problems that inevitably will arise. Raising resilience tools help providers and communities support parents and caregivers to nurture children's resilience. I think we all have stress challenges at different times. Just because you're resilient doesn't exclude you from the inevitable challenges of life. This is what life is. Your resilience allows you to overcome those stressful times. Strong for Life is doing a fantastic job of connecting everyone who, who have adults that work with young people and trying to bring common language to, to the issue. And the resources that we've been actively using are the journal for our younger students, the feeling wheel, and it helps them to, to put some words to what they're feeling inside. We also use a lot of the coping mechanisms that, uh, that we've been trained in through Strong for Life. Our students have been exposed to all of them so that when they're in the place where, they, where they're in need of that, they have something that they can draw on. And we're really looking at children as a whole, both physically, mentally, and their development, looking at ways to promote resilience starting as early as birth. As a mom and a researcher, I know we all wanna do whatever we can to protect our children. It's really important to build resilience in children because it helps them solve problems, it helps them adapt, it helps them deal with the difficulties that the ebbs and flows of life. You know, life is roller coaster. It's full of ups and downs. Raising resilience in our kids is more important now than ever. Join us in making a difference. All right, so we can go to thank you. Um, you can go back one. 
All right, so they just explained all of it, but then the main thing here is that we have really set out to redefine resilience. That's a part of the video or a part of this that they didn't talk about, which is when we started, we did a lot of focus groups with educators, parents, pediatricians, kids, families, and we heard a lot of the myths about resilience. And a lot of it was that resilience is really about pushing through and sucking it up, or some kids are resilient and some aren't. So we knew that a big part of our work was actually redefining what resilience is. So for the purpose of our campaign, it's really this recognition that it's an ability to handle life's ups and downs, but that all kids are born with this capacity to become resilient and it's never too late to start. So there's a lot of hope in that, knowing that this is for every kid. They also talked about um, the idea that this is about prevention. We know that kids are struggling and there's a real need for a lot of intervention as far as mental health services, but this work is really about trying to get ahead of it, not waiting until kids are in a state of crisis and then we're scrambling to get them connected to services, but instead really thinking about stress being an inevitable part of life and all kids needing coping skills to be able to manage that. And so really shifting this from being a very reactive state to much more pro proactive stance that's universally targeting all kids. And that's really what we've set out to do and why we use the language that we do. Next slide, please. Thank you. So that brought us to this idea of raising resilience in nature. And really the idea here is again, let's meet families where they are. We don't want this to seem like it's something extra that they have to add on because it's not gonna happen. If this feels like a chore and we're already stretched too thin for time, it will get sidetracked and it'll be punted away until there's a crisis. So we really wanna make this as accessible as possible. So if families are already spending time out in nature, they're in the parks, they're on trails, then we felt like that was a really prime opportunity to weave in some mindfulness, some coping skills, and really teach them how to tune in to whatever it is that they're experiencing. So we brought this to life with Gwinnett by coming up with different prompts and signage, which we'll go through, um, and some videos and resources that we could then drive them to for more information. Next slide, please. Thank you. You can go to the next. Okay, so the first one is this campaign overview sign. So we didn't want people just to show up, be on a trail and see something without any introduction as to why we're doing it in the first place. So the first sign is really just an overview to the whole purpose, raising resilience. What does that mean? What is this initiative and why are we talking about it? Um, so these are located at the entrance of a lot of the spaces, um, high traffic areas where we're hoping a lot of people will see it, start to get a sense of what it is. So when they come across the other signs that are more specific, they'll already have that foundational awareness about what is coming. Next slide, please. Thank you. And so once they're on the trails, they're going to come across these very specific coping skill signs. And so these are 18 by 24, good size. Um, and the idea is just to get them interested, use the QR code to drive them to a specific video. So calm your mind is this concept of grounding where you really use your senses to bring you into the present moment. And so there's a guided video to walk them through it where they're really noticing, what do I hear? What do I smell? What can I see? And this is a really helpful coping strategy for kids and adults to use because we know that when we're really heightened and we all are because we're living in a really fast paced world, our mind is racing and it's going to the worst case scenario and all of the unknowns and the what ifs. And so grounding is a really powerful technique to teach kids when they're young because it brings them back into the present moment or the here and now. So when their brain is racing, they now know how to shift their focus, shift their attention. And that's a really powerful thing to do. It calms the body and then the brain will follow. And then the second one there, take a breath, is really about deep diaphragmatic breathing, which I know we all say, yeah, whatever, that uh, that doesn't work. Well, normally it's because we're just not doing it the right way. It's not the way we breathe every day, kind of these shallow breaths through our chest. It's this deep intentional breathing. And the more we focus on that, the more kids are 
starting to see that they're capable of regulating their bodies, which again is very, very powerful. And especially as we think about kids feeling high stress because of all the violence maybe they're experiencing in the community or hearing about all the stress in the world with war, climate change, everything else that they're stressed about, to give them a strategy that actually regulates the body and helps the brain is very powerful because then they can show up to school and actually feel regulated enough to focus, retain information and learn. So all these videos are approximately five minutes. One's a little bit longer. Um, and the narration for these is in English, but all of the resources that are on the website are both in English and Spanish. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so we, we don't need to stay here. There is a QR code if you just want to um, pop that in your phone and check these out later. Um, but all of these and more are on the website. Next slide. Thank you. And we also have a ton of other resources. So the goal is really to drive people to the website where we can offer them a lot of different strategies. The videos are a way to get them in, but then we have a ton of other stuff, everything from different forms of guided videos. Some are animated, some are just narration. And then we have journaling prompts and coping skill handouts where kids can kind of circle, what have they tried? What do they want to learn? Um, and then different guides that actually walk caregivers through how to explain a coping skill, how to actually practice it, and how to modify it based on the age and development of their child. And another QR code here if you want to check that out. Next slide, please. Thank you. So our core message is that you'll see if you go to the website and are listening to any of the videos or looking at any of the handouts are really similar. And one is that we really want to encourage caregivers to be teaching new skills when everybody is calm, not in the heat of the moment. And as a therapist, this is probably something I hear several times a day, which is, oh, well, that, that strategy you taught us, it didn't work. But when I ask how they tried to do it, normally it's once the child was already really escalated, parent was escalated or a teacher, everybody's heightened. And at that point, our brain is not capable of receiving new information. So the goal here is really to educate on the fact that we need to teach this stuff when everybody's actually calm. It seems counter to what, what we want to believe that you don't use it unless you need it. But that's not true when it comes to coping. We know that we really need to help kids understand that this is something we do proactively. So when we really need it, we're already really good at it. And ideally, if we're practicing it regularly, we're also going to prevent some stress from escalating and becoming bigger in the first place. Other things here that we're really promoting to not just parents, but to anybody working with kids is that we need to teach them a variety of skills and give them choice in finding what works for them. Because what works for me, you might hate, and that's okay. <laughs> it's really not about us liking the same things. It's about recognition that different days will require a different set of skills and what works for a child in one moment might not work in another. So we don't just want them to find one thing and think that will work forever. We want them to keep building this toolbox and really feel equipped to handle lots of different things that come their way. Next slide, please. So the next thing that we have scattered throughout some of the parks are these conversation starters. And so these are on some tables and some places where hopefully people are gathering and sitting already and naturally talking. And the idea here is just to give a little bit of structure and a little bit of guidance to that conversation. Another thing we heard really loud and clear in our focus groups was that parents and kids were having a hard time communicating. Parents were wanting to know what was going on, but felt like they were getting one word answers and there were a lot of dead ends to their conversations. Similarly, kids were saying, well, it feels awkward or I don't know what to say, or I feel like they're asking me the wrong things or they're gonna have an extreme reaction. So we knew that there was an opportunity to really create some messaging around this and offer families a safe way to kind of ease into these conversations. And so the QR code takes them to a whole series of questions on the website, as well as some of our core messaging for how to frame the conversation and what to do with it. Next slide, please. 
So again, this is just the QR code. This is what it looks like when they go to the website. Um, there are a lot of links and articles that they can kind of go to from there with some communication strategies and how to get your child to confide in you and different things like that. Next slide. And some of our main messages here are that we need to be having regular conversations with kids. We don't wanna wait until something big has happened. In fact, it's, it's not even realistic to expect that kids are gonna to come to us when something big and scary has happened if we're not having these everyday conversations with them. So really it's about making this very familiar and routine. The other thing that we ran into is that people were struggling with how to get into the conversation. They were worried that they had to have the right words or some magic words. And really it was about just empowering caregivers to realize it's all about open-ended questions. You know, if we say, do you have a good day? We're going to get those one word answers of yeah, no. <laughs> and then it feels like a dead end and both parent and child are feeling frustrated and not really connected. So the conversation starters have a whole list of these, um, but it's really about opening it up with a very specific open question. What was the best part of your day? What was something funny that happened? What's, what are you looking forward to? But really simple things that they can just weave into the conversation. Other skills that we're really promoting throughout these resources are to actively listen. A lot of times kids were saying in the focus groups that they just want adults to hear them and they know that you have advice and they know you have life experience, but if they don't feel heard and validated, they're not interested in continuing the conversation. And so really giving adults permission to actually just sit back and let it linger, let them talk and see where it goes, reflects back to them what you hear without judging or interpreting it, and then really validating whatever their experience is. It does not mean you agree with it or that you even feel that same way. It's really just about letting them know you understand and it's okay and normal to feel that way. Next slide. And so then we also have these directional signs just to kind of get people excited and let them know what's coming their way. Um, so this is just an overview of what these look like um, when you get into a space and something's coming up, one of the activations. Next slide. Thank you. And so here, you know, this is still relatively new, so we don't have massive numbers yet. But um, what our marketing team was particularly happy about was the, the watch time, um, because we know that we're dealing with short attention spans in this world. A lot of times people click on something and within seconds they're moving off of it. But with these, we actually are finding that people are lingering, um, which is really exciting to see. We also think that um, another thing we noticed was in addition to these videos, which we're using in the parks, our whole suite of mental health videos and coping videos has gone up a lot in terms of watch time. So we're getting the sense that people might be going and then looking at other things and sharing them. So really happy to see that. And we'll be curious to see how this continues um, as it's been a little longer in the park. So next slide, please. Thank you. And so the Raising Resilience campaign, there is just a ton of information on the website, QR code here at the top if you wanna check it out. But there's a Raising Resilience email series where people can sign up and get little nuggets of information twice a month, just bite-sized pieces of things you can do to build resilience in kids. Um, and then on the website, we've got resilience by age. So it's really broken down in a nice way to help you figure out what you can do depending on the age of your child. We also have this series of stories of resilience is what we're calling it. And our kickoff video was with one of the Braves pitchers, Tyler Matzik, and he was sharing his own personal struggle with mental health and his resilience journey. So it's pretty cool if you want to check it out. Um, from there, we went and we interviewed different families and different people in the community to really highlight what resilience means to them as we're redefining that and shifting the narrative on it. Next slide, please. Thank you. And just another overview. There's a ton of information on here. Obviously, we're talking about mental health today, um, but we've got everything on there from nutrition and sleep stuff to child protection. A lot of handouts, which are 
were originally designed for our school partners, but pediatricians and other community partners have used them as well as it relates to back to school or finding a mental health professional. Um, a lot of great tip sheets and a lot of printables that families can use too. Um, little coping skills and feelings visuals that they can print out and use at home with their kids. Next, I think that might be it. Okay. I'm gonna pass it over to Lindsay now. Perfect. Thank you, Jody. I could listen to you all day, just nice and calming. Okay. I believe Beth, are you scrolling for me? Is it or is it Elena? It is actually Elena. Elena, perfect. All right. Well, happy Thursday to you all. Um, thank you, Beth and Jody, for sharing your insights and to the American Trails team for having us today. Um, before I begin, I have to give a big shout out to our local internet team of Carrie and Brad, Brandon, Gabby, Dicey, Kayla, and Brianna, who are our rock stars doing this work every single day. I'm thrilled to talk about how we here in Gwinnett County are pairing our public spaces with health experts so that all of our residents can fly. Connecting the built environment, such as trails and outdoor recreational spaces with healthcare providers can have a profound and positive impact on overall community health. This integration recognizes the interconnectedness of physical, mental, and social well-being and leverages the environment to promote those healthier lifestyles. Now I'm going to walk us through how we began our holistic approach to community wellness, which focuses on uh, physical activity, nutrition, preventive care, mental well-being, and social interaction. And some of our core programs and also more initiatives done with one of our most essential partners being Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, Strong for Life. Uh, next slide, Elena. Thank you. It is hard to believe that this dedicated work took flight over 10 years ago. The 2013 Gwinnett Community Health Assessment captured our obesity rate at 26%, placing a quarter of the adult population at higher risk for serious conditions like diabetes, heart disease, cancer, respiratory problems, and stroke. It was also known by the assessment that 20% of residents got no routine leader time or physical activity. Knowing this, Gwinnett Parks and Recreation was already in the headspace of being a public health provider. Our trails, playgrounds, summer camps, athletic leagues, senior classes, you name it, we all knew were key components helping residents achieve better health. After launching our dedicated park prescription program, or Park Rx for short, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta Strong for Life approached us about the opportunity to establish health and wellness standards. These were a written set of standards that our organization agreed to adopt and follow to provide a healthy environment. Knowing we were already doing most of these initiatives toward promoting healthy habits uh, for adults and children where they live, work, and play. We were already committed to offering physical activities for all ages and abilities, and CHOA helped us adapt our vending contract to ensure we were providing access to healthy foods and beverages in our vending machines. Being one of the first park and rec agencies in the state to have a dedicated park arts program with staff, uh, fused our commitment towards community wellness and our partnerships and how we would go forward in offering healthy and safe environments for our participants and employees. Through our health and wellness standards, COA also helped us expand our smoke-free areas of play, which I will come back to. They helped us adopt catering guidelines for events and rentals and helped us establish concession food guidelines for our athletic association. Finally, these standards hold our commitment to the return to play and concussion and head injury prevention procedures. With all that happening, CHOA was a part of a healthcare roundtable made up of various community organizations here in the county, school systems, and hospitals. And they looked around and noticed that a key component was missing, parks and recreation. So thank you to CHOA who made uh, helped us make our way to that community wellness table. Ultimately, this is where we connected with leadership uh, from then Eastside Medical Center, who was very invested in resident health. And together, we launched Live Healthy Gwinnett. 
Now, before I jump into the mission, I do want to note how important our county leadership sees this community-wide health initiative. Thus, all operations became county operated in 2015. Go ahead, Eleanor. Thank you. As mentioned before, Love Public Gwinnett launched 2014. I cannot believe we're coming up into the 10th year uh, next year, but it is designed to engage Gwinnett County residents to invest in their personal wellness. This proactive approach to wellness addresses the preventable chronic illnesses, like you heard before, impact a lot of our individuals. It's proven through community education that people can significantly reduce their risk of developing chronic diseases by making those simple lifestyle changes, eating healthy, increasing physical activity, and reducing stress. We all know this now more than ever, having all been through that global pandemic. Uh, but this initiative, which is armed with the support of many partners, focuses on encouraging our residents to adopt those healthier lifestyles by making positive change, by making those positive changes. I do want to note that since our launch, our network of partners has grown to over 300 here in the county. It's due to their support, grants, and donations that there are no fees associated with the public grant program. Go ahead, Eleanor. So how do we break this down? And where do we focus our efforts? Overall, Le Public Gwinnett's mission is to promote positive change in the Gwinnett community that encourages people to be active, eat healthy, get checked, and be positive. Throughout the year, we're leveraging our parks, community centers, partner facilities, you name it, as hubs for activities like health and fitness programs. These can be classes, workshops, events, you name it, to encourage active movement. Coming up, September is National Yoga Month, so you will find certified instructors volunteering their time all month long for yoga in the park. Nutrition education, we have an expert team and partners like UGA Extension Gwinnett who are constantly providing information and resources about eating habits, cooking workshops, and nutrition education on our mobile kitchens that are located at all of our community gardens. Mental health, health awareness is essential, as a lot of you heard before coming through Jody. It is promoted through our dedicated partners, which who have the resources for managing stress, improving emotional well-being, and seeking help when needed. Live Healthy Gwinnett's coordinator, Karen Marslin, is a certified QPR suicide prevention instructor and who has recently worked with Gwinnett United in drug education to train all of the county's fire and emergency personnel. And they'll soon be moving on to all 600 county police officers this year. Health screenings and checkups, that preventive care type. Uh, we are dedicated to collaborating with numerous healthcare providers throughout the county to offer those health screenings, preventive appointments, access to medical resources, you name it. We want to ensure our residents know their numbers they can monitor and manage their health, but also remove that fear of seeing a physician. We know when we park that mammogram van next to our park pavilion, which is right beside a lake, we see residents remaining, remaining calm and ready to talk to those health care providers in an area that they feel comforting in. Finally, online resources are essential. As Gwinnett is one of the most diverse counties in the Southeast, we want to ensure that residents are met with information in their language of choice. We leverage online platforms, social media channels, and websites where residents can access information, resources, and support, especially our community health dashboard that I encourage you all to go check out, which is at livehealthygwinnettdata.com. Go ahead, Eleanor. Thank you. Now the best part where I can brag a little bit about our community change makers. As you know, La Public Gwinnett and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta have been partners from the get-go. I already talked about them helping us establish our wellness standards, vending contract updates, concession food guidelines, and return to play. But I do want to mention a few others and hope that you can take these items back to your community healthcare providers and either start the conversations or grow the conversations. 
Uh, Chella has written curriculums that we use during summer camp and after school programs. In addition to curriculums and activities that we use in our mobile recreation program that you'll hear about very soon. They've created engagement materials for our caregivers, youth, and multi-generational households. Items such as, like you've seen, the postcards, coloring books, stickers, promo items, weekly camp newsletter articles, and everything in between. Um, all those items help keep our families um, moving through those conversations about being happy and well. We've partnered with Chella on many professional development opportunities for our staff and interns. They've done a camp aid ambassador program for us. They've come um, and spoken at just about every single summer camp staff orientation and in various positive youth development series. I commend their support towards our staff teams. They help give us those tools for the difficult conversations like the coping school messages that were mentioned before. And finally, Children's has assisted and been a huge component of various guidelines and procedure improvements uh, that we can do at our department level, but has also supported us in major policy changes for the county. If you remember those smoke-free areas of play that I mentioned before, um, that's where we had limited smoking on playgrounds, ball fields, dog parks, skate complexes, those smaller nodes. However, with the support of Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and our county health department, um, they were able to work with us in our research and request to be a tobacco-free park system, which was ultimately approved by our commissioners in 2020. Very big deal here. Go ahead, Elena. So let's get into some practice, some practical program applications that you can do in your community. Uh, if you have a trail, sidewalk, side path, parking lot, et cetera, you can do this program. Uh, a staple of Little Healthy Gwinnett since the beginning has been our Walk the Talk program. This is where we pair health professionals on our park trails every month. Those walk leaders are talking about various health topics. We've been walking with the University of Georgia about safe food handling, Piedmont Eastside about holiday stress and emotional eating, diabetes you could win about, you guessed it, diabetes prevention. Um, not only are the attendees learning and connecting with their local trail, but they're also meeting community members who may share similar personal wellness goals. And we watch those bonds grow, holding each other accountable. Fun fact, this past Saturday, Children's was out walking with us talking about breastfeeding awareness and resources available to new caregivers. This is a perfect no cost program leveraging your community assets, um, which thankfully has now been incorporated into our employee wellness program. So it's an overall win win. Go ahead, Elena. Another example of signage uh, that we've partnered on with children, uh, this dates back to 2018, focusing on their previous healthy habits. Uh, this campaign included a series of over 10 signs placed along the trail system and around amenities like our tennis court, multi-purpose field, playgrounds, and dog park. These signs reflect messaging of being active, feeding, and nutrition, and living springtime. Go ahead, Elena. Thank you. So you've heard a lot about the raising resilience uh, through nature signs so far in this session. We're thrilled that CHOA approached us to pilot the campaign surrounding their emotional wellness platform. Being able to leverage our trails once again, which as you heard are the most used asset in the county with the interactive signage that supports caregivers and youth meets our county leadership's priority of creating safe and healthy communities where everyone's office. I place this picture here to show how committed our county leadership is towards community wellness. This is our chairwoman, Nicola Hendrickson, and her son, Caden. They're out at Mountain Park Park in Wilburn this past spring, walking and talking with Jody. Uh, this was filmed for an Ion Gwinnett episode where Chairwoman Hendrickson challenged caregivers to talk with their family unit, utilize the interactive resources, on the resilience through nature science and to have those conversations about life's ups and downs routinely. She is a true supporter of Little Healthy Gwinnett's mission of meeting people where they are 
and encouraging their connection to the nature and their public spaces. Go ahead, Elena. My final point for today really exemplifies the whole idea of meeting people where they are. When you are considering how to leverage community wellness partnerships with organizations who have similar equity considerations, public benefit values, and timelines, I want to highlight Live Healthy Gwinnett's mobile recreation program, which we call Be Active Gwinnett. Be Active Gwinnett was launched in 2018 and is a recreation center on wheels, box truck, van, action path. We bring opportunities for safe and fun physical activity to youth in underrepresented play desert areas. Though we have a beautifully nationally recognized park system here in Gwinnett, Hashtag 2023 NRPA Gold Medal Finalist, Lead Us On. Uh, not everyone can easily access the green space and structured activity for positive youth development. So our answer is this, is that mobile services uh, need to be brought directly to our residents. Be Active Gwinnett visits housing authorities, apartment complexes, childcare facilities, extended stay hotels, mobile home communities, faith-based facilities, and even more. The Gwinnett um, is on a mission, like you heard Beth mention, to have a park or green space experience within a 10-minute walk of every resident. Mobile services like the Active Gwinnett are currently being leveraged to close the access gap. This program reaches a wider range of audiences, bringing those recreational activities directly to them, making it easier for people to participate without the need to travel long distances, or altering their caregivers work schedules. It offers a diverse range of activities that cater to different interests and fitness levels, everything that can be scaled. This program builds a sense of community. It fosters social interactions because we do leverage a lot of group and teamwork uh, activities and modules. The Active Gwinnett can adapt to different locations, schedules, seasons, you name it ensuring that residents have access to these opportunities throughout the year. Whether it's a small bit of green space in between the housing units or in a co-op parking lot, the Active Gwinnett is there to set up and you're going to play. Our trained, enthusiastic staff, interns, volunteers, and partners are a must to lead these activities and ensure participant safety and enjoyment. We do our best to ensure the program is accessible to people of all ages and abilities and backgrounds, and to always promote the sense of inclusivity. Finally, a core component of the Be Active Gwinnett program are the partners that travel with us. While our staff, interns, and volunteers are engaging with youth, partners that travel with us, like Northside Gwinnett, are providing health screenings and leaving behind resources for caregivers. So they too are engaged themselves. And with that, I will turn it back over to Beth. Sure. Thanks, Lindsay. So I hope we gave you a lot to sort of noodle on today, uh, a little bit about the Raising Resilience program, about Gwinnett Trails as an entity itself, and then about some programming and some options that you can take home, uh, you know, to your communities and to your trail systems. Um, and so with that, I think, uh, Candice, we are ready for some Q&A. Oh, fantastic. All right. I'm going to get uh, the presenter emails up there. So in case you want to email them directly, you're more than welcome to. A lot of questions. Um, I'm going to start off with, I know that um, Joe, I think it was Jody that had answered this, but a few other people are asking about the health lo locator and getting more information. Is there some information that we can share? Um, like links um, or resources with them? We do have some information on our website, so we're happy to share that, Candice. But actually, uh, Lindsay and I have talked, and if you'll have us back, we would love to give a presentation on the Help Locator system. It's one that we are proud of. We won some awards for, and we've had some a lot of success, so we'd be happy to cover that. It, it It's a whole presentation on its own. Oh, um, fantastic. But simply put, there's a four-digit code that helps people um, people access emergency services when they're needed on our trails. So instead of saying, I'm somewhere along this six mile trail, come help me. They can say um, within a quarter mile, they're placed every quarter mile. So they can say, I'm at this geolocation, or I'm closest to this geolocation when they call in and it helps that reduce that, that save time that they need from emergency services. Great, thank you so much. 
Um, Carson is asking if you used any grant funding for these programs. So we didn't specifically for this one. Um, this is one where <clears throat> Children's Healthcare funded the placards and we used the existing signage infrastructure that we did have. Um, and then our Parks and Rec staff did install a couple of aluminum T signs where we had a few locations that really made sense for placement and we just didn't happen to have a signpost there to attach it to. Um, so it was you know minimal uh, maintenance or minimal capital outlay from the park system and then uh, Strong for Life and Raising Resilience covered the cost of the placards, but we definitely have done grants and funding for other uh, other programming. Lindsay, do you want to cover some of the ones that you kind of worked on? Perfect. Let's see. Um, we worked through quite a few different National Recreation and Park Association grant funds in the past, not necessarily for um, trail specific programs. Um, one being that 10 minute walk um, and the study for connecting two of our properties uh, that are very um, within walkable communities. The other being surrounding um, Meet Me at the Park um, and bringing in some interactive exhibits and dinosaur features, um, more of like a scavenger hunt to get people out and about the different properties to see them. But there's always an ebb and flow of the different grants coming through. You know, us and children's and a lot of our partners are always looking for additional funds to bring initiatives to our residents. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Michelle's asking um, if you're collecting baseline data on youth and community impact. So I'm not sure if she's meaning specific to trails or to the Raising Resilience program. We don't currently have pet counters or anything specific to our trails usage. We do do, like I said, frequent community survey polls and things like that for the trails um, themselves. But Jody and her team are tracking the baseline data, some of the stats of, of viewership and uh, the length of views. And then she's tying that to some of the um, other resources that Raising Resilience has. Jody, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the baseline data that you guys are collecting at Children? I mean, I, th I think you just covered it. <laughs> um, yes. not, yeah, not much more there. Um, we'll just continue to see how people are using those QR codes, but um, not much more than that. Okay. Uh, Lewis is asking if your health program links to the prescription and parks program, and if so, how are the primary care physicians recruited it, to the tenants of the program? That's a great question, and thank you. Um, we are looking to revive the Parker X program um, back. We've had a great conversation with our hospital providers here in the county just recently last week as their residents are becoming more involved in the community wellness arena. Um, though that was our initial focus before we launched with Healthy Gwinnett, we are looking forward to getting back to the dedicated prescription program. Prior, when it was very active, uh, we were working in different clinics and hanging our signs and our posters that outlaid all park properties. And then those clinicians um, and healthcare providers, along with their, say, their, their medicine prescription, mm -hmm. they were writing also prescriptions to go and walk and take your children to the playground. And they were able to look and focus to see what park was in the closest to see. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Michelle is asking, how are you engaging and encouraging differently um, abled individuals to use your trails? Sure. So actually, I'm going to share my screen real quick, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so we didn't highlight it. Again, there's so much that we would love to, to share with everybody about what we're doing here in Gwinnett. But one of our uh, interesting trails is here at the um, Gwinnett Environment and Heritage Center. And it was actually named one of Time Magazine's coolest places in 2019. And it's the Whispering Words Braille Trail at the Environment and Heritage Center. And so what it is, is there's a system of ropes and sort of tactile elements that those with visual um, needs can track along the trail. And then the signage on that trail is in both um, written words as well as in Braille. So that users of all abilities can um, access that. Um, there's a few other components that we're looking at. We, we're doing some work in understanding things of, of adaptive trail use and, and things like that. But our, our Braille trail is one of our, our coolest examples, I feel like, that we're doing accessibility. Lindsay, is there something that you would want to share that I didn't? 
not off the top of my head, other than um, you know, we have a very strong uh, relationships here with our therapeutic partners. Though we don't have dedicated therapeutic recreation staff on board, we leverage those community partners coming out of um, Spectrum or our Angelfish components. So we have a lot of that inclusivity programming, uh, not necessarily taking part on the trails, but within our recreation centers and our aquatic centers. Um, Great. Thank you all so much. And if I could get that link from you, Beth, I can definitely share that with attendees um, as a resource. So thank you so much for that. Um, okay. Let's see. So Kate is wondering, you know, similar to wayfinding signage and branding, um, are you creating any sort of guidebooks for navigating the trail while using it? And if so, can you talk more about the process for creating those materials? Um, sure. So the Parks and Rec staff does put out every year um, a guide to parks. Did I, is that the right, is that what it's called, Lindsay Guide to Parks? Okay. It's a, it's a pamphlet all about the county's park system and programming and all the sorts of do that all the different uh, camps and all the details for that year and then we do have a trail specific insert in that every year that we update based on our where you know we have new trails energies and things like that um, one of the things that we are hearing is a need for um, maybe some more specific navigation within trails so that's something that we're looking to sort of understand we want to make sure that it's something that um, is cost effective and flexible and adaptable as our system does expand, um, but we do have a, a really a wealth of information on our website that is available. We're out in the park, uh, out in the parks, and out in the community, quite frequently helping people. One of the big things that we do out at our community events is just what's the closest trail to me, and sort of educating people on that. So there's a physical presence there, um, and I think those are kind of the two most important things: is that that park pamphlet that's issued each year, and then being out in the public. Great, thank you so much. Um, Michael's asking, um, what are your impressions of how people are using the county trails network? You know, cyclists passing through using traffic free routes, uh, longer distance walkers, runners, families out for a walk from their local park, you know, a little bit of everything. And is there any use you hope to encourage or enable more? Sure. So the answer is yes, all of the above, which makes it really fun from a trail planning perspective to give people mountain bikes and earth trails, but then they want solid surface to push their strollers and, and you know, surfaces that are comfortable for runners with bad knees. And so we, we have all users of all perspectives. Um, currently, a, a vast majority of our trails are used for recreation purposes. And the really driving force for our trails master plan was to um, hopefully offset some of the demands of our transportation system. So we're hoping that we can start to get some connections that they really serve a strong um, transportation function. We partnered with our local metropolitan planning organization or MPO, who every year does a bike tober campaign where they're really helping to encourage bicycle commutes or non vehicular commutes. And so that's one of the programs that we're trying to help push that out. Part of it is just we don't have facilities yet that facilitate that or, um, you know, it's such a far distance. So we're trying to sort of, you know, uh, work on that transportation side. But we do have users of we see people rollerblading and skateboarding and mountain biking, you name it. Okay. Beth, I can add a little bit more um, to Candace. We've been working very closely with our planning and development department who's in the midst of their 2045 uh, development plan right now. Um, and making sure that trails or various multimodal components are being built into those procedures. Or if we do co go towards policy change, making sure we're embedding uh, for new construction or various contractors to implement some type of trail and or connection to our system. Uh, so that's been essential. That's right, Lindsay. Yeah, our, our planning development is looking at a 15 minute uh, community model. Candace, and so we're helping to, to model that and figure, figure out where we need gaps and trails can fill those gaps. Great. Um, Alita's asking, and I, I, I apologize if this, uh, well, let me know if, if you guys had gone over this during the presentation. Um, why is a 12 to 14 foot concrete paved road called a trail? Did you cover that? We, we didn't, um, and I'm not sure okay. if, I'm not sure if what the question is, particularly, we are, um, so we're in a unique space where uh, we're, we're, you know, adjacent to Fulton County, 
And I mentioned that people didn't know that we had a trail system for the longest time, but what people have sort of been reflecting on is the success of things like the belt line, which is 14 feet wide. And if anybody has happened to be on the belt line on a weekend, that's a nice weather day, uh, 14 feet is nowhere near wide enough. Uh, you are not, <laughs> there's no point in bringing your bike out there because you're not riding your bike. You're hopeful that you can push it. Um, so we have, created our topologies to sort of uh, be flexible um, and help us, you know, we are a populated county and, and we're hoping for, you know, a lot of success in our trail systems too. So we're trying to respond to that uh, need in particular. Um, but if you noticed, I don't, we could flash back up our topologies if we needed to, they're actually kind of light on specific uh, standards. I think there's some questions about materiality too in the topics, uh, Candace. We tried to keep our uh, standards very high level and not too rigid because we are 434 square miles and we have areas that are you know kind of on the cusp of farmland we say there's really no working farms in Gwinnett County but they they tier more towards that rural context and then we have incredibly basically urban and some people may not want to call them urban but they are they are urban parts of the community um and everywhere in between and our entire western border is the Chattahoochee River and it's CRNRA uh National Park Service land and so we have a lot of different contexts that we are dealing with um so we don't uh outside of like the concrete versus asphalt and we have trails that have timber bridges or that have uh you know concrete permatrack bridges or different things like that. Um, so our standards are, are really trying to respond to a bunch of different contexts. I'm not sure if the question is criticizing the <laughs> width of the trail or, or not. We do try to, to uh, incorporate low impact design and sustainability measures as much as we can. And so we do look for ways that we can use, um, you know, impervious or, or sort of, uh, I'm sorry, pervious or sort of innovative materials in our development. But uh, our, our width is, is uh, and it's not always, achievable everywhere. There's certainly context that we have to neck down to eight inches or to eight feet wide or things like that. So we, those are our ideals, but we're also trying to respond to things within the community that we're seeing, um, like mm -hmm. so the lines 14 feet wide and nowhere near wide enough in most cases. Got it. Great. Yeah. Well, we, um, we are out of questions. If anyone does have more questions, I did share that in the chat just in case. Um, so before I do the closing though, in case there are no more questions, I just want to share right now our resources. I um, I may not add more to this slide, although I actually may. I, I have all the video links that were sent as well as additional videos that we were we did not show during the webinar. Um, and I will also be sharing the PowerPoint presentation in PDF format. I will share that with attendees um, in my follow-up email so you guys will see that. So, um, and again, the emails um, for the presenters will be linked via their name. So you can contact them with any follow-up questions. And again, we do still have about 10 minutes, 15 minutes um, for Q&A if anyone does have any more questions. Um, so just waiting to see if something comes in the Q&A box. I'm not seeing anything yet though. But if I guess while we're waiting though, uh, Beth, you know, Jody, uh, Lindsay, is there anything you want to close out with at all? <laughs> no. So one thing that I'll share Candace is that- Okay. Uh, in addition to being a Gwent resident, I'm a new mom and some of the uh, practitioners that Lindsay has talked about that are sort of doing some partnerships with the county um, are actually my pediatrician. So when I go for our well checkups with our baby, we're given a packet of information and it has stats about, you know, what percentile she's in and whatnot. But then it also does have the strong for life uh, material, some of what Jody has shared and some other additional ones you know, specific to, you know, your baby being four to six months old or things like that. And um, in addition to those pamphlets, there's also, you know, Raising Resilience is, is getting out in the community. So there's billboards and there's other sorts of ways that you're seeing this. And I think our trails program is really nice, like additional facet to that. And another way of sort of continuity, seeing it again. And we're building that credibility between, you know, healthcare professionals and our trails facilities and, and whatnot. So I think, you know, that's my personal perspective, but I, I feel like there are others in the community that are sort of seeing that um, repetition of, of Strong for Life and Raising Resilience uh, collateral and material out. And so that's really helping to build, um, you know, healthy environments for our, our children here in the community. So I think that's an important, you know, maybe in our case, it's our hospital system, but there may be other things that sort of building a continuity or things that you can think about from a programming perspective too. Great. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that, Beth, because I, 
I heard a similar story recently where a family went to the pediatrician and saw one of the Strong for Life feelings posters on the back of the door and said like, I have that in my classroom, which is exactly the whole purpose of the model being this way. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, I think it's always been the Strong for Life model, but I think particularly as it relates to mental health and all of the stigma that's still attached to mental health, there's a lot of power in kids and families seeing this message everywhere oh, I can talk to my doctor about how I feel. Oh, we're out in the community and we can talk about it. I can talk about it at school. Well, um, some schools, I should say. Um, <laughs> but I think I appreciate you, you saying that because that is that is the whole point of the model. And it's really exciting um, when kids start to pick up on that and realize that there is safety in all of these spaces to be able to talk about how they feel. Great. And uh, we do have um, some more questions. I'll go ahead since we still have time. Um, Julia is asking for anyone who would want to take initiative in their communities towards more accessible trail sy uh, systems and community focused connection. What kind of funding or grants or personnel, um, personnel resources would you recommend? Lindsay, do you want me to, to start and then you kind of circle? Okay. Um, so there are, there's, a, there's a wealth. I mean, I think definitely starting with your uh, hospital system is great. We have, Lindsay mentioned UGA Extension, which is our local um, UGA University of Georgia, our, one of our higher institution um, entities. I think that's a, a great avenue. We've seen um, if, you know, it sort of depends on where you are on the scale of jurisdiction, but, you know, we've partnered with our um, cities, community improvement districts, which I don't know that everybody has, there's different models or, or different systems, but it's a self-taxing district of businesses that want to sort of help support infrastructure in their community. And so um, we partnered with them and the funds that they're able to raise to help uh, advance different programs. So I think that those are some uh, high level ways, but I think even, you, there's the opportunity for you know uh, employers or businesses in your community to see what may make sense to uh, advance things there. There's definitely different 501c3 or other you know nonprofit organizations that you can partner with and see if they have existing you know programming and things like like Jody is, is sharing that you know that already they have and they just need another avenue to get it out in front. So how can you work together for that? Um, so I think it's being uh, being creative there and then. You know, Lindsay, I'll, I'll let you capture on some of the walk and talk, but I think that's a great, you know, that's personnel resources, but it's it's low cost in my opinion. Yeah, Beth, you touched on, especially going and talking to your healthcare providers, whether that's a hospital system or a smaller clinic or the health department or any type of nonprofit in that space. Um, you might also want to consider um, branching uh, services through like Walmart or your local electric company. I know we have a big grant cycle here in Gwinnett with Jackson EMC um, that focus primarily on youth and family opportunities. Um, so definitely those local resources to partner on. Um, I know we've been very successful in certain grants, um, whether they're state or regional, working through a coalition of partners and showcasing we've got more than just one person um, in play here that we're all going to focus on and sustain this program. Great, thank you both. Um, Robert, this question actually came in right after I asked the, the last question, but for Jody, why only some schools? Mm. Yeah, so our program is offered to all schools that want it. Um, the reason I was saying some schools is because this has become kind of a hot topic in certain counties. Um, some counties are experiencing some pushback from the community about social emotional learning type of programs. Our, now ours is not a structured curriculum. We're not identifying certain kids. It's really universal and um, it's really about prevention too. So ours is a little bit different. Um, we're not telling kids how to feel or how to think. It's more so giving them some language and some awareness that they can practice some of these skills. But um, that has become a challenge in certain areas where um, 
the community is pushing back and there are, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what some of these programs are. And so there's some fear around social emotional type of learning and what messages kids are receiving. And so that's, that's the only reason I said that um, is that this is available for all, but um, it's going to be challenging in certain districts if they are restricting certain kinds of programs. Right. Thank you so much for clarifying that. And great question, Robert. Mm -hmm. um, Lauren's asking, um, do you have natural surface trails, you know, soil-based narrow trails for hike, bike, running incorporated into the system approach? We do in, in our system. So the trails master plan is largely looking at expanding trails outside of our parks. A lot of those um, natural surface trails um, are going to be more within our park system. We have tons of, of really beautiful parks and really, if you looked at a, a map of Gwinnett, really huge parks, lots and lots and lots of acreage. And sometimes they are encompassing you know, gorgeous lakes and other water bodies and things like that. And so those uh, trails do definitely feature natural services. The trails master plan on the other hand was really looking to expand trails outside of our park system and make bigger connections either between parks or between destinations or serving commuting patterns, things like that. And so natural services aren't um, really geared towards that kind of movement. So they're not in our trail topologies, but it doesn't mean they're part of our trail system. They're just sort of within our parks um, already. Great. All right. Well, I really appreciate all your time. Thank you so much to Beth, Jody, and Lindsay for answering all those questions, um, as well as addressing some in writing um, during the, the presentation today. So I really appreciate that and appreciate the attendees' interest in this very um, important topic. Um, and again, a reminder, I will share this resource, this slide that you see on your screen within two days following the webinar. Um, along with the link to the recording and the closed caption transcript. And I, again, want to also thank the partners of this webinar that include the Bureau of Land Management, the Federal Highway Administration, the National Park Service, um, as well as the UAE Forest Service. And we hope you'll be able to join us next week um, for our next free webinar in our Advancing Trails webinar series. Um, and a reminder, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel to get a notification when this webinar um, today's webinar and all of our webinars are available as a recording and we're starting to go live on YouTube so you can get um, notifications when we do so you can still be in the loop even if you're not joining us via Zoom. Um, and our YouTube channel is youtube.com slash American Trails. So thank you again to everyone for attending. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and happy trails. Thanks, Guinness.